Hello, today we are continuing our discussion on the uh, uh, idea of visual rhetoric. Um, we just finished up the uh, Prodigal Son book uh, written by Henry Nouwen, where we talked about Rembrandt's uh, painting, Return of the Prodigal Son. And the big takeaway from that for my students and for those who are entering the conversation, if you did not, uh, if you're not in my class, is you read uh, Henry Nouwen's book, uh, Return of the Prodigal Son, which looks at Rembrandt's painting. And what you notice is that uh, you can take one painting and you can pack in a lot of discussion. Um, what we usually do when it comes to museums is we usually walk around museums, we look at a piece of art, we say, I like it, I don't like it as far as aesthetic reasons. But what I challenge you to do is to go and learn a lot more about the context of the piece of art, the, the painter, the sort of cultural, societal, political reasons, um, why the art was uh, created or what was the context of the time in which this art was created. And you just have a better, deeper appreciation uh, for the piece of art you're looking at. Uh, so don't just look at the aesthetics of the art. Aesthetics are important. Uh, but as far as just sort of like reading into a piece of art, uh, it can tell a it can tell a very interesting story, um, and it can have a lot of power uh, if if you learn if you learn the the context around it. All right. So again, Henry Nouwen writes this book. It's about 150 pages or so, but it's just about one painting. And so that's what I'm challenging uh, students to to do here is for the for the next paper is you pick a piece of art. You only have to write a four page paper. Um, but it's a lot more than just like, I saw a piece of art in a museum. I liked it. I didn't like it. It's, I saw a piece of art. Here's some stuff about the artist. This is when it was created. Here's some context around it. Like you can dig a lot deeper into the art if you sort of learn all these elements of it. So today we're going to talk about the Sistine Chapel as well as the David. Uh, we're going to make this brief. Um, there's obviously, there's a lot to talk about in here. Uh, and then our next uh, PowerPoint, uh, we're going to kind of change it up a little bit and go into a little bit more um, contemporary um, artistic pieces. So this is a picture of the Sistine Chapel, uh, just a visual reference. I'll get into a slide of sort of like where it is and when it was painted and everything. But you can see, you know, it is, you know, ceiling, walls, everything is just, you know, painted, right? It's going to take several years uh, to kind of put this together and sort of lay it out. Now, obviously, you can walk into the Sistine Chapel, you look up and you just like the, the, the impossibility of just all of this coming together is sort of the first thing that hits you. And you can say, wow, this is incredible. This is uh, aesthetically pleasing. But again, the more you know about the stories that are being told through these paintings or the stories that inspired these paintings, uh, the longer you can stay in the Sistine Chapel and sort of like really read into the painting, All right? So this is what we're talking about as far as visual rhetoric. This is the centerpiece, so God creating Adam here, uh, which is you know a picture that all of us are probably familiar with regardless of whether or not we, we went to church, all right? So this is centerpiece, uh, sort of, at the at the, the top of the ceiling this in the middle of the ceiling so the Sistine Chapel uh it is located in uh, Vatican City all right it, it's painted by Michelangelo over the course of five years and it's painted in fresco right which means into the wet plaster so these aren't like pictures you can take off the wall and put them in a new museum it's like the paintings are there you know on the walls themselves um the School of Athens is also a painting that is located in the Vatican uh painted by Raphael um, and most of these paintings are done sort of, you know, in fresco. Um, so painted into the wet plaster onto the wall, uh, they're not coming off. You can't hang them in different museums, All right? So this is one thing to sort of think about as far as, you know, accessibility to art, you know, it, you know, this, this art piece is more than just the painting. It's actually a part of the building um, itself, part of the architecture. Uh, so this becomes something of interest. When it comes to the Sistine Chapel, again, this is one of those things where if you do some research before you go to Vatican City, uh, you start to have some more appreciation with regard to the stories that are being told through the visual cues. So it depicts nine scenes from the book of Genesis. So if you want to understand the visual aspects of the painting, you also need to understand right, the book of Genesis. Okay, And this goes on with any sort of artwork. Anytime you visit a museum, it's more than just aesthetics uh, um, with regard to liking paintings or not liking them. All right, it's about sort of understanding the stories, right? And this is one of the things I constantly challenge my students on. All right, so a couple of the stories that are being depicted, right? So uh, again, in, in the painting that you see in front of you is the creation of Adam. So God reaching down and sort of touching, but not quite touching fingertips might become important, right, uh, uh, of creating Adam. You also have the separation of land and water as far, you know, 
as far as you know the the seven days of creation story right creation of the sun and the moon creation of separation of light and darkness all these stories are depicted uh within the sistine chapel and again there's lots of other characters here that are sort of shown throughout uh, the old testament um, and the more you know about the Old Testament going into the Sistine Chapel, the more you're able to sort of point to different characters and scenes on the wall uh, and have a deeper appreciation for it. Uh, a quick story that, I'll, that I tell my students sometimes is a few years ago, um, I went to uh, Madrid to, and uh, while I was there, I saw Picasso's uh, Guernica painting, which is extremely large. Um, I, don't, I don't know the exact dimensions, but my quick estimate memory is somewhere about uh, eight to 10 feet tall and probably about 20 feet wide. So let's just say it's 10 feet tall by 20 feet long. Um, and it's it's all sort of in like this blue gray scale. Um, and it's a depiction of uh, bombs uh, being tested uh, on these small cities around Spain. So for those who don't know, Spain was involved in a civil war uh, leading up to World War II. So Spain was not involved in the Second World War because they were dealing with their own stuff back home. Um, however, Franco, who is the dictator, tyrant, you know, uh, individual, other bad words, uh, individual who was in uh, ruling Spain at that time. Uh, he was friends with people like Hitler and Mussolini. And so uh, he basically goes to his buddies and say, look, I can't help you in this whole Second World War thing. But what I can allow you to do um, is that I understand that, you know, Germany is trying to create all these new cool bombs. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and test those out on these various cities and small towns around Spain that um, are trying to revolt against me? So um, it was a way in which Franco would uh, get the Germans to kind of help him with his civil war by dropping bombs on his own people, right? But it's also a way that Germany uh, benefited because Germany was allowed to test out some of these bombs that they were creating um, as like, you know, the United States is in a rush to sort of figure out who can sort of create these like atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, et cetera, all right? So all these new uh, devices were being created by Germany. Um, so anyways, I go and see this Pablo Picasso painting uh, called Guernica. And I sit there and I'm in complete awe. I've learned about this story for you know decades, you know, coming up through school, learning about different art classes. Uh, I walk in front of the painting and I am, you know, it, it's incredible, right? Um, and it's incredible. Um, you know, it, it for me, it's aesthetically pleasing to look at. Um, I know that Picasso is in, you know, something that not everybody enjoys. I don't like all of Picasso stuff. I definitely prefer, you know, the sort of Renaissance art uh, compared to sort of more modern 20th century art. Uh, but there are a few Picasso pieces that I enjoy. Um, but it's also it's like because you understand the story as to how and why Picasso painted this with regard to the, the Spanish Civil War that you sit there and it's 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 emotional right it's it's a lot of people screaming uh you know you know people being killed like it, it's 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 this gut wrenching piece of artwork to see especially when it's ten feet tall by twenty feet long like it just it pulls you into the painting and you're sort of pulled into uh, just the agony uh, of that um, situation. I'm with a friend of mine um, my friend looks at the painting for about two seconds, looks at me and says, I don't really understand this. I don't really understand why people sort of, you know, are so moved by this painting. And she just kind of walks off and just kind of like starts wandering around the museum again. Um, and this is one of those moments where I sort of think like, you know, perhaps if she would have understood the the story behind the, uh, the Spanish Civil War and what was going on, um, you know, there's this whole entire sort of floor um, in a museum in Madrid that's just all about the Spanish Civil War. And instead of just kind of like blowing by all these paintings, um, you know, some of them Picasso, some of them other painters who are more sort of traditional and realist, uh, you know, instead of just kind of walking through the museum and just kind of like, okay, let's get to the next painting, let's get to the next painting. Like if you kind of stop each moment and realize like these paintings were done during Spanish Civil War, why bombs were being dropped on people, why, you know, you know, lots of people were being killed by like this awful, horrible, gut-wrenching experience. Um, you just have a deeper appreciation for the, the artwork and you can kind of sit with the artwork a little bit longer as opposed to saying, I like it, I don't like it, and moving on to the next painting, all right? So um, with the Sistine Chapel, you do the same thing. You learn a little bit about the book of Genesis and then you go and sit in front of the Sistine Chapel and not only do you say, all right, it's a beautiful painting, but you also say, okay, I understand the stories. Like Michelangelo is like walking us through the book of Genesis in all these interesting ways, all right? So, Here's a couple items, right? So he has the creation of Eve, uh, temptation uh, of Adam and Eve, right? And the expulsion from uh, the Garden of Eden. Uh, we have depictions of Noah, right? And the ark, the great flood, the drunkenness of Noah, all this other kind of stuff, right? So again, all these sort of like small, smaller stories are within the Sistine Chapel. And if you understand the book of Genesis, you can look at different things and say, oh, that's, that's Adam. Oh, that's Eve over here. Oh, that's Noah, right? Oh, there's a flood going on, right? We see the next one, right? 
There's also a depiction of the 12 prophets. So if you know anything about the Old Testament, you can work through the prophets. And again, you can work through the prophets that are kind of going on in the top of the Sistine Chapel. All right, there's 12 prophets. You say, okay, what's this significant about the number 12, right? 12 tribes of Israel, right? And all these sort of other symbolism sort of worked within the paintings, all right? You could just say, oh, there's 12 prophets and move on. But if you sort of understand some of the stories, uh, the biblical stories, uh, it all comes together. And again, this isn't a question of whether or not you believe in the Old Testament, the New Testament, you know, what your religion you are, whether you know you have a religion. All right, it's just a question of like people created these sort of symbols within paintings, these stories within paintings, these depictions within paintings for certain reasons. And if you understand some of the context, you understand the, the artist, you understand uh, the, the context of the stories, but you also understand the context of the time period in which the art was created. Uh, you just have a deeper appreciation for it and you just feel more involved in the um, in the in the artistic uh, the, the artistic expression. Right. If you go to a museum, it's like you just kind of feel more involved in the museum as opposed to walking around being like, I like I like this painting by Picasso. I don't like it by Picasso. I just kind of move on to the next thing. So here's some of the different prophets. You can kind of look them up, you know, Jonah and then down the rest of them. Um, but all these individuals are depicted throughout the Sistine Chapel. And if you look up and you see certain certain prophets doing certain things, this becomes something that's interesting. All right, moving on to a different depiction by Michelangelo. We have the David, which is you know a sculpture, obviously, uh, carved out of marble. Um, and some interesting, you know, and this was created before uh, he got to the Sistine Chapel, which one of his paintings. A um, couple cool things about Michelangelo, you know, it's taken him a few years to do it, right? But it's also 17 feet tall, right? So, you know, for a little bit of a reference, imagine like two basketball hoops stacked on top of each other. I know it's 20 feet, but we're getting close. All right. So this thing is enormous, right? So if we kind of take his waist right here, right? Like that's about one basketball hoop. And then there's two basketball hoops, right? So this thing is massive, all right? Now, obviously you have this depiction of David. Um, and you have to say, okay, well, you know, who was David? Why, why David? Who's this David person? Um, again, you have to sort of understand some of the story behind who David was, uh, biblically speaking. Uh, I love this quote by Michelangelo, um, you know, whether or not it's direct translation or whether or not it, he actually said it or it's attributed to him, regardless, right? But I, I do like this idea when uh, it says, you know, they asked Michelangelo how he made the statue of David. He's reported to say, it's easy. You just chip away the stone that doesn't look like David. All right, so this is kind of how Michelangelo was, you know, reportedly sort of approached all of his sculpture work was this idea that the sculpture was already inside and he didn't really see himself as he wasn't carving. Yeah, um, he wasn't carving the marble into whatever he wanted. He just sort of looked at it as like, oh, the thing's already in there. And I just kind of got to, you know, uh, carve away the marble that's not supposed to be a part of part of the statue, um, part of the sculpture. All right. Um, so we sort of look at the David here and let's go to the next slide. All right. So, oh, I apologize for how tiny this font is. I did not realize it did it. All right. But if you want to critique the statue, you say, okay, what do you need to know? All right. Well, some things you want to know is like, well, first of all, foremost, who is David? Um, now, for most of us, you probably know David from the Old Testament stories. Um, you know, if you're a student of mine and, you know, you're in an American classroom, chances are, even if you didn't grow up in church, uh, you were probably around enough sort of uh, influence from the church, you know, the, the, the story of David. Now think about this in contrast to some of the sculptures you might walk around and see in other museums that are more uh, sort of Greek or Roman gods, right? So there's a lot of Greek and Roman stories that are depicted in um, uh, statues and sculptures throughout museums that, that most people are less familiar with, right? So we might blow by a lot of these statues and sculptures and say, ah, there's a sculpture of some interesting sort of like Greek legend happening and, you know, I don't really understand it. I don't know who this God is. I don't know who this goddess is. And we kind of walk by it, right? If most of us were to see the David, most of us would probably know like, okay, young kid with a slingshot taking out Goliath. Like we would probably at least know that basic uh, information about it, all right? But just by having that much, most of us probably look at something like the David and we're just kind of drawn into it more, right? Now imagine if we knew more Greek and Roman legends and stories about the gods and the goddesses and then we walk around different museums and we see these sculptures of gods and goddesses uh from these different cultures all of a sudden we're drawn into these stories we're drawn in these sculptures more all right so again learn some things about the art that you are going to visit um when you when you go out into the world when you visit museums or you, you visit different um cities around the world that might have sort of public displays of art 
you'll learn a little bit more about it and all of a sudden you get drawn into these things and you appreciate them more all right uh so down here we have you know david with the slingshot um i just took a couple close-up or i didn't take them but um included some close-ups so here um you have uh david with the sling over his shoulder right and, and here his hand uh he has a you know he has a stone in his hand he's about to put in a slingshot um i just love this because of the veins like the, the detail in which michelangelo completed his works uh is in, absolutely incredible all right uh, you also want to know like who is michelangelo all right so you want to know a little bit about the artist right who are some of his contemporaries so who are some of the artists that were also doing work at this time all right so again i mentioned um in the in the vatican so michelangelo painted the sistine chapel but there's also paintings in there by Raphael, uh, one of the more famous ones known as the School of Athens, which I also teach in a different class. Uh, the time period in which it was painted. So um, what was what were the politics and cultural norms uh, during the early 1500s in Italy? All right. And obviously, you're going to need the story of, of David and Goliath to fully appreciate, like, what's in his hand? What's over his shoulder? What's going on here? Right. And again, for most of us in the United States, it's like we, okay, it, it, it's very obvious. It's like, oh, it's a sling and a, and a stone to sort of kill Goliath. But again, you take this and you sort of translate it into, hey, there's a lot of sort of Greek and Roman uh, mythical figures uh, that there's also depictions of. They're also holding different objects in their hands. Uh, they're wrestling with different, um, uh, they're wrestling with different people or different animals. Or, and we kind of walk by and we're like, okay, there's a Greek and Roman God. They have something in their hand, but I don't understand it. So we walk by it here it's like we automatically go to slingshot um or a, a sling and a stone uh and that you know that's something that draws us in so again learn about other cultures and what is depicted in that artwork and all of a sudden you're going to see a culture and you're going to see a, a greek or roman god or somebody else right holding something in their hand and you're like oh i know the story behind sort of what it is that that's being depicted all right. Uh, so, yeah, David was this like young shepherd. Right. You have these sort of giants coming after him and his people. Um, everybody else is getting killed. He takes a stone, slings at his head, kills him. Um, good for him. Becomes king. Yay. All right. Kills Goliath, becomes king. All right. Finally, um, something else that's interesting as far as like says, contemporary issues going on in Italy at the time. So obviously the context is artistic, it's biblical, but it's also political in some ways. All right, so there's this family known as the Medici family in Italy um, that was trying to return to power uh, at this time in the early 1500s uh, in Florence, right? And they were, you know, this family that controlled a lot of the money in the banking industry, right? And one of the stories behind the David is that the, the, uh, the David was created, right? And so you have this sort of like small shepherd, right? And David and Goliath story of this, you know, this tiny little shepherd boy killing this sort of like giant, right? So there is a story that says um, when uh, Florence had no place for the David and like once it was completed, what they went ahead and did is they ended up putting in this like uh, piazza, right? This sort of like, um, like, a, uh, like a roundabout, if you will, for like a 2020 kind of thing like this little roundabout area where all these streets come together it's like we're going to put in the middle of the city um so that you know the medici family just sort of gets the gets the idea it's like look like we already um had this huge uh political and social fight over over banking um and uh i get it that you're a very strong family but you know we the people uh kind of mentality it's like we're going to put this statue of david because david can defeat this goliath in, in this place it was this sort of like large banking family um, so it's sort of like uh, it was used as a sort of um, political or social commentary when it was first made to sort of be placed in a certain area of the city uh, to show that, you know, the people were sort of strong against the oligarchs who were, you know, trying to sort of um, uh, have a lot of influence over the wealth and the banking system of Florence at that time. Right. Um, so this is, a, a you know, an interesting side story. You know, it's not just like david was created just because michelangelo was sitting around and saying like oh, i just want to create this statue of uh david you know the, the the young shepherd who ends up killing goliath um but then it's also sort of used as a sort of you know it, it's used in different ways uh during that time period to sort of show the strength of people against this sort of uh you know um very powerful family uh and there's, there's lots of ways in which arch translates differently based on the context uh in which it's used based on the time period um, there's ways in which we sort of like make depictions of David in 2020 and have these sort of David and Goliath stories as metaphors. Uh, so 
dig a little bit deeper as opposed to um, art for art's sake. Art for art's sake is important, right? It, it's important to have an, just an aesthetically pleasing surrounding and community, and you know, it, it's important to sort of create beautiful things. Um, but we also, you know, need to recognize that we can't just, you know, uh, if we want to have some commentary on art or sort of like how is art sort of shaping our, the world around us, how, how are visual cues shaping the world around us, how is architecture shaping the world around us, um, how are public monuments. It's not just like someone decided to make this thing and, you know, stick it out there visually. It's a, But somebody made this item and learn about the history, learn about the artist, learning about, you know, how that piece of art has been used to send certain messages or what messages it might send. Um, and it becomes a lot more uh, it becomes a lot more interesting. All right. So learn the stories behind um, learn the stories of the Old Testament and then go to the Sistine Chapel. Right. Learn the story of David and Goliath and then go stand under this, you know, 17 foot tall, you know, like just like massive, you know, piece of marble. Um, and it, just, it becomes a lot more meaningful that way. All right. Um, and the same is true with sort of you know, broadening your horizons when you when you look at other art uh, and other sculptures. OK. Um, so that's what I have for now with regard to the Sistine Chapel and the David. Um, and we will get into uh, some di some discussions on contemporary issues on the next power uh, on the next video. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about like Confederate statues um, and some of the controversy around them in the United States as far as public monuments. OK, that's all I have for this video. I will see you later.